Okay, good morning, everyone. Let's, uh, let's begin to get going as people come on in. Uh, it is Thursday, and so it is time to move on to a new topic. I am going to um, just leave acid rain for the moment. Uh, let's see how the rest of the semester pans out, and if we have time at the end, I'll do a well. I'll do a summary anyway, but I'll see if we have time to uh, to come back to that. But um, uh, I feel like we've done air pollution uh, some justice, and now we will move on to talk about stratospheric ozone. So let me just give you a uh, a kind of caveat here before we start this, um, and I think I made mention of this on Tuesday. There's some there's some material in here that's quite uh, conceptually quite difficult, um, and you, there will be uh, a couple of questions in exam number two uh, that deal specifically specifically with stratospheric ozone, and I'll be um, very clear as to what those are and my expectations of you in in answering those. So. Having you know looked at the the results from from past exams, uh, the second exam that in, uh, incorporates the material in chapter five, um, the students who do well are those are the those are the ones that that get the the depletion of ozone over Antarctica. So that's one of the things I'll be very specific about. You know, explain to me how and why ozone is depleted, uh, where it is at the rates that 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 happen. Um, for those uh, who don't cover that material. Uh, exam two may be a little trickier for you. So there should be no, you know, there's no hidden surprises. I'll be quite explicit here as to as to what will be an exam two on this chapter. I hope that makes sense to, to everybody. So we're going to deal with, uh, with stratospheric ozone uh, in chapter five. So the first point here uh, is to, again, just reiterate, make sure that you're all happy with and that you're all comfortable with this distinction between tropospheric ozone and stratospheric ozone, right? Um, the, the functioning of these two different layers uh, couldn't be more stark, right? They are totally different in terms of their environmental functioning. So we've covered this layer here. This is the troposphere. Remember the ozone here is the bad nearby. This is the human-made ozone, right? This starts with the emission of pollutants like nitrogen dioxide and volatile organics, and then those are changed uh, through reactions with sunlight uh, and not with ozone, but with, with things like uh, sulfuric acid with water, but with ozone specifically the reactions with sunlight to produce the secondary pollutant ozone, which is in and of itself a pollutant and also forms part of this uh, mixture, this photochemical cocktail of smog that we uh, that we experience in the lower levels of the atmosphere. This morning we go here. We go into the stratosphere. We're moving up in sort of sort of the 10 to 15 mile range or the 20 to 25 kilometer range. This is uh, stratospheric ozone, right? And it performs a very a very different function. So that's the first key point here. Uh, they are both, I think quite interestingly, they are both chemically identical. They're both O3. There's nothing magically different about O3 in the stratosphere and O3 in the troposphere, other than they perform different functions and they are formed and destroyed in different ways. And that's what we'll talk about for the rest of the morning. Right. Important diagram number one, everybody. Um, this diagram shows the vertical concentration of ozone uh, from the ground up. So we've got altitude on the left axis here. Uh, in miles, and we've got altitude in kilometers, just to keep everybody happy on the, the metric and the non-metric. Uh, the bottom axis here is ozone. It's not expressed here as a concentration, everyone. It's expressed here in terms of the amount of pressure that the ozone exerts in the atmosphere. So let me just stop there. Um, so the air above your head right now, right, is exerting a force on the top of your head. And that that force, the sum of, of all of those gases, is what we experience as, as atmospheric pressure. Uh, and as we'll talk about next week when we get to look at chapter six and climate change, the majority of the gases above our head is nitrogen and oxygen, right? There's some carbon dioxide, water vapor, and, and, and so on. There's also O3. There's ozone in the atmosphere, but it is a tiny, tiny fraction of the amount of, of the total amount of gas that sits in the atmosphere. So what this diagram does is it plots the vertical distribution of ozone. So it shows you how ozone is concentrated, distributed vertically, right? From the ground up on average uh, through the atmosphere. 
So you can see here, and I've, I've labeled this with an arrow, this little increase in ozone that you see at the surface, right? Uh, from the ground up to a kilometer or two, that is the tropospheric ozone. That's the low level ozone, the chapter four, the pollutant ozone, okay? Uh, and it amounts for about 10% of all the ozone uh, in, in the atmosphere. And that's, that's the problematic component of ozone. So ozone is concentrated at the surface. It decreases quite rapidly up to you know, about two to three kilometers. And then it's fairly well mixed in the atmosphere until you get to the second layer in the atmosphere, right? So this is the stratosphere over here, the second layer uh, in the atmosphere. So here we are beyond where airplanes fly, for example, right? Airplanes fly at 35,000 feet. Um, this is well beyond that, right? Here we're talking about 10 to 15 miles where ozone begins to increase and reaches a maximum concentration somewhere at an altitude of about 15 to 15 or so miles or about 20 to 22 kilometers in the atmosphere. And then ozone begins to, to decrease from there, right? So this layer here contains about 90% of the atmosphere. It's the stratospheric ozone. It acts as a very important field to harmful ultraviolet radiation. Uh, and here's the most important component. It is formed and destroyed naturally, right? But there is a human component to that, and that's what we will talk about today. So does that diagram make sense to everybody? Anybody got a question on the vertical distribution? I would imagine that you may see this again at some, at some point. Everybody you happy said, with that? Chanera. You said the stratospheric ozone is destroyed naturally, but there's a little bit that is controlled by humans? Yes, so okay. that's, that's, that's well put. It's, it's created naturally which I'll explain in just a minute. It's destroyed naturally, but there is something going on in that ozone layer in the stratosphere that humans play a role in. And that's what we'll get to in just a little bit. Is that, I know that seems a little cryptic, Mira, but does that make sense, at least for the moment? Yeah, it does, thank you. All right, cool, good question. Okay, everybody else happy with that? All right, great. So then let's move on and talk about how ozone is formed and destroyed, right? Again, naturally in the atmosphere. So the legend on the left here, so we've got an oxygen atom, then we've got two oxygen atoms to form an oxygen molecule, right? This is the diatomic oxygen that we breathe. And then we've got three oxygen atoms that make up an ozone molecule, right? So that's the legend. So here's how ozone is destroyed and created naturally, right? In the stratosphere, we've got diatomic oxygen, O2, right, the oxygen that we breathe, in very, very small concentrations. But it's up there and it is split apart by sunlight, right, by high energy ultraviolet radiation coming in and it strikes the diatomic oxygen and it splits them apart. That the technical term there isn't, isn't critical, but if you're desperately interested in it, it's called photo disassociation. I'm not going to ask you that. Uh, but it takes that that oxygen molecule and it splits it into two oxygen atoms. One of those oxygen atoms will then combine with another O2 to form O3, right? This is a natural process. Sunlight strikes oxygen, breaks it apart. The oxygens, the individual oxygen atoms combine with O2 to form an ozone molecule, right? That's the, that's the first couple of steps in the creation of ozone if that makes sense. Please, folks, just fire away if you have any questions as we go through this, okay? Then what happens is sunlight on an ongoing basis, it's not like steps one and two happen first, but what happens continuously is incoming solar radiation, so the sunlight will then simultaneously split apart ozone molecules into separate diatomic oxygen and oxygen atoms if that makes sense. This diagram captures and summarizes the creation and the destruction. That is a natural ongoing process all the time in the, in the atmosphere. UV light is, is breaking apart oxygen molecules and creating ozone molecules and breaking apart ozone molecules and creating oxygens and individual atomic uh, oxygen. I hope that, that makes sense. It's a pretty simple and straightforward 
diagram, I think. And over time, what has happened is that that process, that natural process, has built up a concentration of ozone in the stratosphere. And that concentration of ozone molecules in the stratosphere is what protects us from this harmful UV radiation. And it protects us from the harmful UV radiation right here, right? Because this is the job of, of ozone molecules. The job of ozone molecules is to absorb that UV radiation, right, before most of it gets towards the surface of the Earth. Okay, so that's the creation and the destruction. Now, the next point um, is if we were able to, and I can give the answer that we're not, but if, so if we go back to that, that diagram of the vertical concentration of ozone, so here's the surface, and then it does that, and here's the stratospheric ozone, right? If we were able to take all of the stratospheric ozone here and compress it down, just physically compress it down into a layer that we could measure, that layer would be about three millimeters thick, right? Three millimeters. Extraordinary, when you think about three millimeters, protects us from whether we're here or not, right? Um, that's not how ozone occurs in, in the stratosphere, of course, right? It's, it's not this three millimeter shield. It's dispersed in this concentrated zone that I showed you in that diagram. But if we could compress it, it would be a thickness of three millimeters. And how do we express ozone? How do we measure it? Well, we measure it by, and I'll just circle it down here, the unit of measurement is the Dobson unit, right? So that is named after George Dobson. He was the scientist that came up with the instrument to measure the concentration of stratospheric ozone, the Dobson unit, right? And one millimeter of physical thickness is equivalent to 100 DUs, and, that, and a DU is the Dobson unit, okay? In other words, all of the ozone in the stratosphere at a thickness of three millimeters, if we were to compress it, would give you a value of about 300 Dobson units. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. And that's a useful number to remember, right? 300. That gives you a, a pretty good ballpark figure for what we should consider to be average ozone concentrations in the atmosphere. It's somewhere between 280 to 300, but, but 300 is good enough, right? And 300 Dobson units would be considered average background stratospheric ozone. Okay. So how does this work in terms of the ozone absorbing ultraviolet? Now, we are going to spend some time early next week talking about ultraviolet radiation, how it gets to us from the sun, um, and the different wavelengths and all of that. But for now, let's just talk about ultraviolet, right? UV ray wavelength. Ultraviolet UV are waves of energy that come to us from the sun. They're very short wavelengths. They're high energy wavelengths, but there's not just one single type of UV, okay? There's what we call UVA, and I've drawn this on this little diagram here. There's UVB and there's UVC, okay? And as we move from left to right here, from UVA to UVC, the intensity of that ultraviolet radiation gets, gets larger, it increases. In other words, UVC, is the dangerous stuff. That is the high intensity uh, ultraviolet radiation, okay? And the good news with UVC is that stratospheric ozone, by the time that UVC makes its way down into the stratosphere, the ozone layer gets all of it, okay? So that harmful UVC doesn't get, get through to us. UVB a little bit gets through and UVA a lot of it gets through, right? So this is the stuff that we put sunscreen on for to protect us from UVA, okay? Uh, UVB is more harmful um, to ecosystems uh, and plant life. UVA causes premature aging, has been linked to skin cancers uh, and so on. So that is the, the human health environmental significance of this material, of the material in chapter five. We take away that very thin ozone layer. We take away that three millimeters. All of this UV radiation gets in. And we don't have to worry about exam number two, and nor do we have to worry about exam number three, right? We, life would not exist on this planet if we didn't have this protective layer uh, of ozone wrapping around uh, at about 15 to 20 miles up. Okay. Thoughts, comments. Make sense? All right. All good. 
So that then is the formation and destruction of ozone, uh, just back to the cycle. And, and that's what I mean by UV radiation and the harmful UV rays um, before, they, before they really get to the surface of the Earth, especially the, UV, the UVC. OK. Right. Now, the story of ozone, the, the environmental story of ozone, uh, is really quite an interesting one. Uh, and I will tell you, everybody, I'm not, I'm not too concerned if a little bit of this material today um, leads over into Tuesday's lecture, because I don't just want to rush through this. So that's a bit about the formation and the creation of ozone. Let's talk about how this became an environmental issue. Like, why are we dealing with, uh, with ozone? So in 1974, uh, a paper was published uh, in Nature by these two scientists. Uh, F. Sherwood Rowland on the left and Mario Molina on the right from the University of California uh, at Irvine. Irvine. These were um, environmental chemists. And they published this paper where they showed uh, unequivocally, beyond all doubt, that human-made chemicals like CFCs, chlorofluorocarbons, and here in the, the title of the paper, it's called chlorofluoromethanes, right? Just a similar compound. But any human-made compound that had chlorine in it, that's the first part of that, chloro, right? The chlorine, that it was the chlorine that was destroying ozone. That had the ability to uh, destroy atmospheric ozone. A really, really important paper, one of truly the benchmark papers in environmental sciences and environmental chemistry. Uh, this was met by a great deal of skepticism by the chemical industry, in particular DuPont Chemical. Uh, and they were the ones that were producing the substances that were containing chlorine. So what were these substances used for? Well, CFCs, right, chlorofluorocarbons, were used as propellants in spray cans. They were, were, were used as refrigerants. And they were used in a wide variety of medical applications. And the reason why they were so popular is they were thought to be inert, right? They didn't smell. Uh, they seemed to be harmless. Um, they, were, uh, they, were, they were not seen as sort of some panacea, but they were widely used as refrigerants and propellants and thought to be chemically, chemically uh, harmless, chemically inert. Uh, that proved not to be the case. So. Um, so there was a pretty controversial paper. And just as a, just as a sidebar, uh, these two scientists, along with Paul Crutzen that you see on the left here, were awarded the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 1995. Uh, it was split three ways. Anybody recognize the gentleman on the, on the left there, Paul J. Crutzen, or anybody recognize the name, just incidentally? Does that ring a bell to anyone? Ah, remember in chapter one, we talked about the Anthropocene. So he was the one who came up with that term in 2002. He was the one who first proposed that we should be looking at this period uh, that we were living in uh, as a new geological epoch, right? The Anthropocene. So he coined that term, but he was also part of this research group um, that, uh, that showed uh, that CFCs uh, and other chemical compounds were destroying, were destroying ozone. It's unfortunate that there's no Nobel Prize in environmental sciences. So the environmental science community claims as the, as the first environmental prize uh, in the environmental sciences. Great paper, uh, important work, right? Controversial, but, but eventually after a few years, uh, it, it was around about 1977, 1978, that, the, that the, the industry and in particular DuPont Chemical said, okay, you know, we may, you may have a problem here in terms of chlorine destroying um, ozone. Okay, all good. Any questions? Okay, right. Now here comes the first um, caveat. Okay, this is a complicated cycle. So I'm going to take this slowly. This diagram in the book, this may look pretty overwhelming, right? This figure that you see in the book. Um, and it's not. I don't want it to, I don't want you to feel overwhelmed by the cycle, everybody. But I do want to take my time and go through this and really explain what's going on here because it's a it's a fascinating story and and I know I'm an environmental nerd and I get that uh, but it really is a cool story as to how this uh, played out right 
please, please put in the chat or uh, interrupt me as we go through this if there is anything that is not clear. Okay. Now there's a chicken and egg uh, scenario here. So this is the chlorine cycle, right? And this cycle shows how a single chlorine can destroy thousands of ozone molecules, right? Uh, the chicken and egg problem is this is only part of the picture. This is part of the ozone destruction picture, okay? So let's talk about the chlorine cycle here, and then we're going to come back a little later on and build this in to what's happening over Antarctica, because that's where, that's where the, the ozone is really uh, most problematic, all right? So the chlorine cycle. So here goes. Everybody ready? Let's get to the chlorine cycle. So the, the starting point, and I've drawn these out as, as steps here. So let's work through this. The starting point is down here. Step number one, right? Step number one is the release of gases that we call ODS, ODSs, ozone depleting substances, right? And these are gases like CFCs. Right? These are compounds that create things that, that, sorry, that contain things like chlorine, fluorine, right, CFCs, that's not an S, CFCs, uh, and carbon, right, chlorofluorocarbon. These are the propellants, the refrigerants they were used in solvents, right? These are also known as source gases, right, because you have to emit these and you have to emit them with the chlorine as part of those source gases. So source gases and ozone depleting substances are the same thing, right? Uh, there's other types of ozone depleting substances, right? There's other halogen gases, there's things like bromine, but we're gonna focus just on CFCs here because those are the most important, okay? So here's a CFC molecule, right? There's a chlorine, there's three of them, okay? There's the fluorine, there's the carbon, and I've drawn these, I hope, chemically correct. So you go outside with your spray can, and that gets into the atmosphere, and that contains the CFC, right? Step number one. That CFC is then broken apart or broken down by sunlight, right? So UV radiation breaks apart that chlorofluorocarbon, and there are other chemical things going on here and free up the chlorine. Step number two, right? They free up the chlorine. Does that make sense, right? So the sunlight takes these chlorines and frees it up. And that CL, everybody, is the culprit, okay? That is, is molecular chlorine, right? Now, does that chlorine at this point just run off and start destroying O3, okay? Well, it does, but it does so in, in relatively small, at relatively small level, okay? Um, why? Well, part of the reason why the destruction of ozone doesn't happen here in, in a very large way is because large quantities of the chlorine then go into combining with other things like H. So here we've got H and a chlorine. Does anybody want to know what HCl is? Hydrochlorine. Yeah, close. Hydrogen chloride, good, right? HCl, hydrogen chloride. So this chlorine that is freed up joins up with a hydrogen atom to form hydrogen chloride, right? The chlorine here that is freed up also then reacts and joins up with nitrogen and three oxygens to form another substance here called chlorine nitrate, Cl, right? Sorry, ClO, NO2, chlorine nitrate, ClO, NO2. So everybody, here's, here's the first kind of asterisk here. I want you to remember these two substances, very important. Chlorine nitrate, ClONO2, and hydrogen chloride, HCl, right? Okay. Those are 
now what we call the reservoir gases. These are the reservoir gases, okay? So the chlorine that is freed up by sunlight, over, right over here, some of it gets released and can go and do some ozone destruction. Most of it goes into these reservoir gases, hydrogen chloride, chlorine nitrate. I hope, I hope that makes sense and seems clear at this point. Does that make sense? And then those reservoir gases, over longer periods of times, weeks, months, get transported to the poles, okay? Because that's how atmospheric transport, transport works on the planet. So let me just try and draw this here. Here's the earth, clearly, right? Uh, so here's the earth, okay? And sunlight's coming into the earth, all over the earth. This part of the earth heats up, right? The tropics heat up and the polar parts are cold, okay? And what happens is all of that heat out of the tropics is transported towards the poles. And so the reservoir gases like hydrogen chloride and chlorine nitrate over weeks and months get transported towards the polar regions, okay? Question from Caroline. What were the two reservoir ga gases you wanted us to know? Was it chlorine nitrate and HCl? Correct, Caroline, good question, thanks for that. Hydrogen chloride and chlorine nitrate. Those are the reservoir gases. So those don't attack the chlorine, right? They don't attack the chlorine, the hydrogen chloride and the chlorine nitrate. They don't have any ability to, uh, to destroy chlorine, right? This chlorine that's tied up here is literally tied up, right? Can't do anything with it, if that makes sense, okay? So here's another interesting quirk, or it may seem counterintuitive if, if everything's making sense to you, right? The reservoir gases get transported to the polar regions, okay? Now you would imagine, right, that you would have, well, let me ask you this, where would you think you would have more ozone? Over the tropics or over the poles? Intuitively, given what we talked about in terms of the natural creation and destruction of ozone, where would you expect ozone concentrations to be highest? Over the tropics, so if you're sitting in Costa Rica, or if you're sitting over the poles. And one of my colleagues is sitting in on our lecture today, Dr. Rhiannon Main, and she has sat over the South Pole, right? Where would the concentrations be highest, do you think? Does anyone want to have a guess? The tropics. The tropics, Sunny says the poles. Teresa asks, why do the gases get transported to the poles? Let me, let me stop there. Teresa, that's a great question, right? Why do they? Because that's how the atmospheric winds actually happen on the planet. The tropics heat up, that hot air rises over tropical regions and moves out towards the poles and the, pole, the cold air from the poles caps, comes back towards the tropics. There is, Teresa, this ongoing game of past the hot potato between the tropics and the poles as the air moves out from the equatorial regions to the polar regions. Does that make sense to you, at least visually, as to what's going on? Yes. I hope so. Okay, cool. Good question. Um, so we've got the poles and the tropics. Let's go back a second. If ozone is created by sunlight, right, wouldn't you expect there to need more ozone over the tropics? Probably because that's where the creation reactions are highest. But the ozone concentrations are not, right? You would expect them because of the atmospheric transport to go down towards the pole. So here we are, step one, chlorine is emitted. Chlorine is freed up by sunlight. Some of that goes to destroy ozone, but relatively small amounts. Let's put an X there saying that's not real significant. The majority of that chlorine goes into these reservoir gases, gets tied up, and those reservoir gases get transported towards the poles, right? That's where we are at the moment in the chlorine cycle. Okay, so once that chlorine is freed up, okay, now here's, here's the chicken and egg bit, right? Let's just focus here for a second. This chlorine that is freed up, I said, can destroy an ozone, right? Not the res... Uh -oh. Siri's talking to me on my iPhone. These gases don't do anything yet, but let's take this chlorine over here. 
this chlorine can destroy an ozone, right? It can destroy an ozone molecule. And here's how it works in step three in this diagram. That chlorine comes up to this ozone molecule and steals an oxygen, okay? Leaving behind O2, a diatomic oxygen. Here's that diatomic oxygen. So the chlorine comes in and steals one oxygen and becomes this, chlorine monoxide, CLO, right? Chlorine monoxide. Now that is a reactive gas, okay? Chlorine monoxide is a reactive gas. And then what happens is an oxygen atom pops on and steals this oxygen from the chlorine monoxide, forming another O2, freeing up the chlorine, and now starts what we call a catalytic cycle. This chlorine finds another ozone, steals one of the oxygens to become chlorine monoxide, forms an O2, goes and hunts out another ozone and goes up, oh, here's another one, steals the oxygen, forms an oxygen, frees up the chlorine, right? That is the catalytic destruction of ozone by a free chlorine atom, right? That can happen and it does happen, but that doesn't happen in a big way over the tropics because as I said, most of that chlorine is tied up in these reservoir gases and gets transported to the poles. Now, let me stop there and see if there are any questions on that. That's the chlorine cycle. This part here, everybody, let me make one more comment before we go on. This part here, where the chlorine is tied up in the hydrogen chloride and the chlorine nitrate, that is the most important component of ozone destruction and that happens over the polar regions, right? So yes, some of this chlorine is freed up here and it does destroy ozone here, but most of the stuff happens, most of the destruction happens from these reservoir gases. So we have to just put the destruction of ozone on hold for a moment. All right, questions. I hope there are lots of questions because I know this is a little, more, little bit more. Okay, great question, Sandy. Why is chlorine not banned? It is. It is in CFCs, right? So chlorine at the surface, so if you put chlorine in your pool, that chlorine cannot get into free chlorine in the atmosphere to destroy ozone as part of the cycle, right? Same question, uh, Chenera Brown. It's a, it's a different molecular makeup, right? So chlorine, and you know, when you go to a, a wastewater treatment plant, they chlorinate the water, that chlorine chemically cannot, uh, cannot be part of the destruction cycle. Good questions, love it. Anybody else, does that make sense? so far. So what we're going to do is we're going to come back a little later and revisit these reservoir gases, because those are the most significant in terms of the destruction of ozone. So the environmental issue then, just as a quick summary, is O3 in the stratosphere will absorb ultraviolet radiation, predominantly UVC and some B, with that chlorine cycle destroying ozone molecules, more of that ultraviolet radiation gets in towards the surface. Okay, all good, another question, love it. If the chlorine is banned, where is it coming from, right? So the chlorine, so the chlorine in CFCs is banned under a protocol called the Montreal Protocol, which we will tie in, Ari, at the end of the lecture. Um, and and that, is, that was phased out, or that was started to be phased out in, in 1987 with subsequent amen, uh, amendments. Um, but it's, it's, it's also, it's not completely and totally banned because it's also part of, there are also other, other ozone destroying substances like bromine, right? The problem, Ari, uh, Ari your, your question's a good one because chlorine stays in the environment for a long period of time. So you can ban it, but it stays there and keeps going through its destruction cycle, okay? Are the ozone molecules reproduced? question from Sandy. Yes, yeah, Sandy, they are, right? They are, they are reproduced. Remember the natural destruction and creation, okay? You're destroying, you're creating, you're destroying and you're creating. But we've got to add the second component to the chicken and egg. The second component is what's going on over the South Pole that makes this such an environmental issue, which is where we headed to next. All right. Any other questions just on the chlorine cycle? 
All right, cool. So what's going on over the South Pole? So Roland and Molina published their paper in 1974 and scientists from the British Antarctic Survey uh, had noticed that ozone uh, levels over the South Pole were starting to uh, go down. They were starting to decline during the 1970s. Up until the point in 1984-85, where these three gentlemen, right, I've got, I've put in the little caption there. I just added this caption this morning. It's not of any great significance, but these are the three uh, scientists standing in front of uh, a Dobson spectrophotometer. This is what measures ozone. Uh, they found that the ozone over the South Pole was thinning to the extent that they felt comfortable to publish this paper in 1985, saying that there is a quote unquote hole in the ozone layer, right? That the ozone layer was beginning to open up, okay? That these ozone depleting substances that Roland and Molina had first published a decade earlier that they had said was eating through the ozone. They then said by 1985 that uh, that, that was directly linked to these ozone uh, depleting substances. So I know this is a grainy picture, but I, I, I like to show it here because it's from the original publication. So what you're looking at here, let me just uh, get the annotator going. So this shows ozone, right? So there's 200 Dobson units. There's 300 Dobson units. Right? And this shows ozone from 1955, and these are averages through to 1985. So here's 1955, 1960, 65, 70, and 1985. Okay, here's the 1985 benchmark where these three scientists published the paper, the famous hole in the ozone layer paper, right? In other words, they detected that ozone concentrations over the South Pole that were 300 Dobson units, remember that number, the average background concentration, were now something like 200 Dobson units, right? A 30, 33% decline uh, in stratospheric ozone uh, over the South Pole, right? That was another really important uh, paper and that made its way into the headlines and we start seeing things like, you know, increase in cataracts and skin cancer and the ozone hole is raising concern uh, and so, right? Okay. So 1985, the paper comes out. So let's talk about the ozone hole for a second. Here. So it's a bit unfortunate that it's it's referred to as a hole because it's not a hole, it's a thinning. But, you know, that's, that's how it's portrayed. So this shows uh, ozone over the South Pole, okay? Uh, this shows normal ozone levels. So just look at the scale here, everybody. This is the ozone scale. Remember this color here, the sort of very light blues and the, and the early greens, that's 300 Dobson units, right? So here's, here's ozone normal levels of ozone in the fall, and here is ozone in the spring over the South Pole. Now, here's the other thing I need to mention. Spring over the South Pole, what time of year is that? Okay, that's not March. Spring over the South Pole is? August and September. Remember, everything's upside down down there, right? I grew up, or I was born, right over there, okay? So spring in the South Pole is August and September, okay? Just remember that, right? And this here is the so-called ozone hole, right? The hole doesn't mean the ozone goes down to zero. It means it goes down to, well, technically, anything less than 225 Dobson units. That's another useful number to remember. Anything less than 225 is technically thinning ozone, okay? So you can see here, spring in the South Pole, we've got ozone down in the hundreds, right? So it's a thinning of that layer, but it's kind of maybe fun and perhaps useful to think of it as, as a whole. Does that make sense, everybody, what you're looking at here? Okay, so that's looking at the South Pole over Antarctica, this gigantic continent. A couple of plots. This shows the average minimum ozone hole, right? Average minimum ozone, okay, over the South Pole. Now notice the dates here, everyone, 21 September to 16 of October, right? That's the spring. And each of these diamonds here is the average minimum that was measured over that three-week period. 
from 1979. So Roland and Molina published their CFC paper here. This is the data point incidentally right there that those three scientists published the whole, okay? Here's ozone in 1992 and 2019 is 161, right? Dobson units. I'm not gonna tell you what the 2020 numbers are yet, but it'll be interesting to see what they, what they look like. I will we'll probably, well, we may get that today. We'll certainly get to that Tuesday. Okay, someone talked to me about this idea. What can you, if I was to give you this in exam and say, discuss the trends in stratospheric ozone over the South Pole, what would you say? What can you say about the trends there, everyone? What jumps out at you? Like a time before 1989 and 2000, and before 2004, there's like spikes that are kind of like significant. And then in 2019 and yeah. Okay. So there's some spikes, right? Yep. And we're going to have... We're going to have spikes. We're going to have years where we have unusually high. Uh, 2019 was really unusual, right? 2019, that is one of the, how do I phrase this? Highest minima, all right? 2019 looks like the whole's kind of recovering a bit. But look at this. I take your point. Here's a decline. It goes down, it goes down. And then we have this period from about 1994 where ozone doesn't really change very much. Yeah, we've got a, um, a higher concentration here and a higher concentration, but you know, it's, it's kind of fluctuating around this sort of pretty steady 100 Dobson units. Here's another way to look at it, everybody. This may help. This shows the hole over the ozone layer, but not expressed in terms of concentration, but expressed in terms of size, the geographic area of the hole where ozone is less than 220 Dobson units. So when you look at the little cartoon or these little diagrams that are on the bottom here, right, here's the, the scale here is less than 220 Dobson units, right? That gives the geographic size. And it shows the hole in the ozone layer. This is the 1984-85 uh, data point there, where the hole becomes the size of Antarctica, right? So we have areas where the hole is small. And look at this over here, right? Look at 19, uh, 2019. Last year, 2019, was one of the smallest ozone holes on record. And I'll explain why next time when we get to talk about temperatures and so on. Okay. And if, if you're struggling with looking at contextualizing the size of the ozone layer, think about this, right? This is the ozone hole in October 2020 on the left hand side here. Okay. And I chose that for specific reasons. So that's October 2020. Okay. And here is the size of Antarctica on the right, and here's the size of the United States drawn equally, okay? This is actually a really neat website, everybody. I don't know if you've ever been to this website. It's called The True Size Of. It's a very cool website, and you can pull any country from around the world, and you can pull them down onto the equator and see exactly how those sizes look. So if you drag Greenland down to the equator, it doesn't really look very impressive, right? Because of the way in which the projections work. So when we're talking about the size of the ozone hole, Antarctica is larger than the lower 48, okay? So that's the, that's the, the, the hole in, uh, in the ozone layer, right? I'm actually gonna just skip that for a second because I'm gonna come back to that and, and tie that in. Okay, so Antarctica is where it's at. The South Pole, Antarctica is where it is at in terms of the destruction of, uh, of stratospheric ozone. All good. Any questions? I have a quick question. Yes, fire away. So since you said that the ozone hole isn't a hole, it's the thinning of the layer. Yeah. So why are the charts describing the situation as a whole? Like, oh, this hole is the size of Antarctica if it's the thinning of the layer. Yeah, that's, a, <laughs> that's a really interesting question. Doesn't it just kind of sound better to talk about, a, you know, a, to the general public, like, a, a hole rather than a, I, yeah, I mean, I get your point. It's just like, I don't know. That's an interesting one. Um, I mean, it technically is a thinning, right? Um, but it's just reversed to, it's just referred to as the hole in the ozone layer, right? I, I don't know. Janera, you're right. It should be the thinning of the ozone. It's just, it's kind of a, an interesting one to me because we have a scientific concept, right? A difficult scientific concept. And we have to then make that digestible by the general public, right? So conceptually, people go, well, 
if there's a hole there, then there's more ultraviolet radiation getting in. That's a problem, as opposed to saying, well, it's a thinning and maybe it's not so drastic. Or the general public might go, okay, so it's thinning from 300 to 200. I mean, that's not a big deal, is it? I mean, it is a big deal, but maybe it's just easier for the public to, to digest. That's probably a really poor explanation. But you see where I'm coming from, Chinura? Does that make sense? Yeah, I understand. It just it, makes sense to me because it's like, you know, you want to be accurate as much as possible, but like you're using terminology or using these graphs right. inaccurately. <laughs> that, no, absolutely. Oh, no, I totally, totally agree with it. And you're smart as well. So you get it, right? You get that it's a thinning and, uh, and not a whole. Maybe environmentalists like to be a little more dramatic, you know? It's a whole, and therefore we have to protect it. But I, I totally take your point. Any other comments or thoughts or questions? Okay, so here's where we're headed from here. We're almost out of time. So let me make a, a couple of wrap up points here. Um, so we've talked about how ozone is distributed in the stratosphere, okay? We've looked at the significance of it in terms of absorbing ultraviolet, harmful ultraviolet radiation. We've said that it's formed naturally and destroyed naturally and builds up this background concentration of ozone at about 300 drops a minute. Right? We've also said that there is a human component because we're emitting chlorine in the form of substances like CFCs, which are ozone depleting substances. And that chlorine destroys the ozone. Right? That chlorine takes an ozone, breaks it apart, turns it into a chlorine monoxide, breaks it apart, turns it into a uh, chlorine, and it goes round and round and round. The complicated part of this, I think, is that the majority of that chlorine is actually transferred or becomes the reservoir gases of hydrogen chloride and chlorine nitrate, and they get transported to the poles. And that's why we focus on the poles, both the North Pole and the South Pole, but much more the South Pole for reasons that we will talk about on Tuesday as to this thinning, not hole. Chanera, I'm not going to refer to it as a hole anymore. The thinning of the ozone layer, right? That begins there, you to, there you go. That begins to open up uh, and close. Uh, we're going to explore that on Tuesday and, and get to the bottom of why this happens. This is the part that is most important, and I'll be totally transparent with you. This is the part that I'm going to ask you in the exam. I'm going to ask you, please explain how and why ozone is destroyed so rapidly at certain times of the year in certain places on the planet. That's what it comes down to, right? So that's what we will spend our time on Tuesday talking about. And as usual, I will hang around for as long as need be. If there are any other questions, I'll stop the recording. Uh, and we will see you on Tuesday, everybody. Thanks.